from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Launch Project. I am Matthew R. Mihan, alongside my partner, the professor, Luigi Rosa Bianca. What's on tap this week, Lou? Matt, I usually say thank you to guests when we end. This whole time, I'm going to start by saying thank you before we begin. The next gentleman on our podcast has had an illustrious career at the corporate level. I mean, he's worked for some of the finest and greatest firms on this planet. Coca-Cola, Daimler... Harley Davidson, et cetera, et cetera. If I had to read them off, we'd end the podcast. <laughs> then what he did, something really interesting. He applied all that knowledge and wisdom and know-how and pearls of wisdom and everything he learned from osmosis. And then he narrowed them down so that small to medium-sized business owners can use them. So Aaron Barr, thank you on behalf of Small Business Owners America for doing that. But we're not going to let you off so easy. You actually condensed all that wisdom to seven universal truths. It's like your your seven commandments. What are they, Aaron? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Professor. Um, yeah, no, I uh, been on this journey uh, fifteen years, kind of on the road with uh, very large companies and their boards and executive leaders, and taking them into to different places like uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, Singapore, Shanghai, London, and then visiting the most exponential companies in those ecosystems. So I got this great opportunity to both learn at the the very high level of boards and leadership of you know global 100 companies, but more so I learned from walking into the room with these entrepreneurs that were disrupting those big companies and literally facilitating a conversation. And so I, I kept writing all this notes, and um, you know COVID was a blessing for me because when things shut down and I got all these facilitated learning experience expeditions canceled. I had like literally a dozen of them canceled. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I took it as an opportunity. I was like, well, I'm going to write that book. And I had 1200 pages of notes. And, um, in that I ended up finding these seven truths that really were filter or lenses, uh, into the consciousness of some of these exponential leaders, both of very small companies that were growing at hyperspace, as well as some of these people in the boardrooms making, you know, literally billion dollar decisions. So. That ultimately became Exponential Theory of the Power of Thinking Big, which uh, became a um, USA Today and uh, Wall Street Journal bestseller uh, that I'm really proud of. It's a it's a piece of work that I put a lot of time and energy and uh, thank God the world shut down. I don't know how to say that uh, any other way. I took it as a blessing. So how did you get involved from the beginning? Let's go back with these larger global 100 companies. Yeah, so I um, I had a digital strategy firm called uh, Buzzmouth um, that I I really grew from about 2001 to, to I sold it in 2015. So before social media, and you got to think about this, uh, we just called it content strategies because we didn't really even have Facebook. And you know, I mean, I wasn't putting together MySpace. I was just creating content strategies. You know, I don't think the word MySpace. content. I don't think the word content existed back then. 2015. Now it's out of everybody's mouth every day of the week, every hour. Yeah. And, and that's where um, we were leveraging, you know, really link strategies and different things for companies and, and getting up going. But I, I built that up. I worked with uh, Google um, in, in one of their uh, philanthropy divisions, I actually become a delegate of something called Google Ideas that ultimately became Jigsaw. Um, very much involved in, in helping them do some things that were, were pretty interesting. I, you know, appeared in a Wired magazine article um, you know, working with counterterrorism and different things because of things I was doing with Google. So ultimately that spin that forward, I had this digital strategy agency was really a small business owner in Arizona. Uh, we kept growing and growing because everybody said, uh, what's, how do I go online? What's my strategy? We built 400 websites. Uh, we started building all these different strategies. Um, and then we worked into bigger companies. So I worked with Coca-Cola and that ultimately led me to facilitating these conversations around digital and innovation and where the world's going, um, which led me into being what I'd call an innovation facilitator. And I really embrace this idea of facilitating, which I think is the super skill for the future. And it's 
part of my new Change Agents Academy is like teaching people how to facilitate, even small business owners, is you never want to get caught selling something because everyone's in a buyer funnel. So you just want to facilitate a conversation and see if it's the right thing for them to buy and even for the right thing to even be your customer. And I think it changes the idea of sales on its head. I, I also ran the National Association of Sales Professionals. And I left that organization when I wrote an article that said sales is debt. And uh, so on my magnum opus there, leaving that organization, I was, you know, the idea was uh, that you never, people feel when they're getting sold to and they don't like it. I mean, it's like a visceral experience where, you know, public speaking may be one of those things uh, that people hate, but they also hate getting going to get a used car because they're getting sold to, you know, they know. Know, But you kind of run your own tombstone because you can't stay in in a pot as part of an organization like that, when you say sales is bad. I was like, that was on my way out, Luigi. I just, I, I, I realized when I pinned that, that um, the organization probably wasn't gonna stand behind me. But the, the goal of it was, is that, um, and, and I created a, a thing called the buyer funnel that really, you know, turned sales on its head. And it really is to go for the no and just be very consultative. And I think today you now see that sales process almost everywhere, especially throughout you know, technology sales, which I've worked with a lot of those organizations doing that as well. So um, a lot of things kind of come together with innovation facilitation. And then I found myself in the boardroom at Coca-Cola and Daimler, you know, literally helping them think through their future and understanding that uh, this digital thing that was never, you know, is disrupting them. And, you know, the speed at what digital companies were doing uh, was disrupting kind of their core business. And that's where we've kind of seen that take place on the stage over the last 15, 20 years. And I had a front row seat, which I, I captured in this book, Exponential Theory, that um, really kind of talks about the stories of Google and Facebook and Amazon and Tesla. How did they actually over that time, you know, and I was going in and out of these companies, often visiting them because our big companies would always come to me and say, hey, we want to go meet with, you know, Tesla. Or we want to meet with Facebook. And so I would take them to Silicon Valley or maybe Facebook, New York or Google, New York. And we would actually, you know, create a learning facilitation and an experience an exchange where one, you know, Google wanted, you know, these big companies to spend more money with them. So it became a, a process that we talked about really interesting things that were going to disrupt each of those companies. And um, really, you know, it allowed me to, to get a firsthand view. But then I started applying it to my own, you know, digital strategy firm and ultimately sold that and just kind of did this full time uh, since then, since about 2015, when I um, left my left my company after I sold it, um, had a one year that I needed to stay on and then kind of parted ways. And uh, since then, I've just been, you know, traveling around and that led me forward to, to writing that book and then now launching the Academy. Ari, can you share with us a fun anecdote? Uh, one of these boardroom stories that may have happened over the years? Yeah, without getting any <laughs> specifics, um, you'd be amazed at how disconnected some of these boards are from reality. <laughs> so, you know, as as uh, just in denial, I mean, and I, and I say this because today, uh, part of what we teach in the Change Agent Academy is this mindset of uh, almost like improv is yes and. Um, at the end of the day, if you start, thinking that you know better than the world or better than, you know, what you want to hear is the spectrum of opinions and then literally form your own based on all of the information you learn. What I found is, is the further up you go, the less they know the truth about what's going on and the more that they just see the world, you see the world as, as you see it. Um, so that's why we've gotten, the world's gotten into so many problems around um, what you say is, hey, you know, treating people right or treating the planet or any of those things, because when you're up there and you only get a report that you're doing a great job because no one wants to upset your apple cart, um, it, it becomes a, a conversation. So there's many times where, uh, you know, the, the analogy of, you know, telling the emperor, you know, to, I forget the analogy of the cloth and the emperor, um, but really just, you know, being the person of candor. I guess one story I can tell you is a soft is a soft drink company. You can, we've already kind of talked about it, but I was on stage and um, outside. <laughs> we had a hundred executives, and they said we bleed red. The chairman at the time said we bleed red, and he walked off stage, and I got to follow that. And so I took the garbage can, and I was like, well, I'm either going to make an impact or I'm going to get kicked out of here. But I threw the garbage can across the stage, and everybody, you know, 
of course, everybody's like, what's going on? You know, and I, this is probably the, one of the funniest things because out of the garbage can was a bunch of different Dasani waters, a couple Coke Zeros, but not one of these cans was a Coca-Cola. Oh, I just, I just said it. <laughs> Whoops. You don't have to believe that out. I think, I think that everyone knows that uh, Coke's not good for you anymore. But as that fell out across the stage, it really was, okay, you know, you want to bleed red, but you realize that your sales, you're a water company at this point. And they are a water company. They make more money from non-carbonated drinks than they do from carbonated. Um, but that experience, you know, led them a very dramatic shift in their mindset. And it's funny is now the Coke Zero can is red, and I don't want to take any responsibility for that. <laughs> I bleed red now because that still is uh, one of their, it was one of the biggest producers out of that is Coke Zero selling it into McDonald's at that time was something that gave them one of their biggest lifts. It was a multi-billion dollar lift from that uh, disruption um, experience. So that experience really uh, helped change their mindset towards me. And, and I think their own mindset to themselves is like, how do you shock people into the fact that the world is changing faster than you want it to? You can either resist it and let the world go by you, or you can embrace that change and kind of lean into it. And that's what I've done at the corporate level, but now in my Change Asia Academy, really helping small business owners, you know, kind of disrupt themselves and uh, put themselves out there in a new way. But isn't that true about any company that actually makes it for a lasting period of time, right? They need to be adapt and they need to change, you know, from their products, their services, their offerings to their clients and how they engage with them overall. I mean, yes, Coca-Cola sold soda. They're a water company now. They put out vitamin water, all these other companies that they're buying up, they're buying up market share with, right? You had um, Blockbuster, perfect example. They didn't want to adapt and change, right? They had the opportunity to buy Netflix. They didn't do it and they got put out to pasture, basically. And this is what capitalism does to companies. So why do you think most large executives are resistant to change? Well, it's it's this fact that they just, they don't, you don't see the change. I mean, in fact, when things are going okay, like you can still hit incremental growth from acquiring companies and from doing these things, but you don't see the rest of the world is growing exponentially. So there comes a point that all exponential companies, if they're growing at 50 to 100 to 200 percent, if you look at any kind of diagram and you're just in a linear path, there's a deceptive period that then they disrupt you and then you can never catch them again. And that's what we've seen in so many different industries where these new companies have come in and we ignore them. And you, you know, you can use the, you know, blockbusters in my book. I literally talk about them, but Airbnb and Uber, like Airbnb, all the hotel companies didn't ever recognize. And now you see on Marriott, they have homes and all these different things are, you know, they're, they're trying to catch up because Airbnb with a, with a little bit of a digital strategy in a marketplace could pick up a few hundred listings in a week which meant they picked up a few hundred hotel rooms that they don't have to clean, <laughs> that they market. I mean, if you just think of a better business model, and that's really what I taught as a professor for 10 years was better business models. And that's what this book kind of captures is the ability for small companies to disrupt is because they can move faster at a better business model than big companies. And when that growth happens, they're either going to get acquired by the big company, which is what big companies often do to just maintain where they're at. Um, but the value that a company used to, and all companies, and I really talk about this in the book, all these major digital companies that all became trillion dollar companies, they're not, you know, they're kind of falling off of that now, but when they were, they literally embraced change, you know, like Apple as a company, even though they have more cash on hand than 10 or 15% of all the S and P 500 are really changing their model because they realize that they have to get to the next model, the next business model. And they've changed dramatically, you know, when they went to having uh, an iTunes store to the app store to, you know, products are part of that, but really that infrastructure that they have and that connectivity, they're now pushing into a new realm that, that is. And if you look at all these different conglomerates, they've kind of acquired different digital pieces that kind of look very similar to each other about how they're executing that, whether it's Facebook or uh, Microsoft and that's where you realize like Microsoft has probably done the best job because they were somewhat irrelevant, say eight to 10 years ago. And now they're very much back part of the conversation because they've reinvented their whole model and they may have been a laggard, but now they're doing it better than AWS or even Google, Google cloud. So it's, 
figuring out how these models, you know, find the future the fastest and iterate the fastest. And big companies, you know, just technically have a harder time doing that. Smaller companies, and that's the beauty when I go and work, is they can make changes pretty quickly. And if you have a lot of resistance in a small company, it's going to die. And that that is what I see more than anything because their existence is generally based on a few customers or maybe a few hundred customers. And it's generally based on a few relationships of a few people. And if you disrupt any of that, then these small businesses, the business model is a superior. And if they're not willing to change, the one thing that is for certain is everybody's business model has to continually improve for them to obviously continue to just keep the market share as well as grow it. So it's figuring out how you help these leaders as well as their leadership teams kind of think as change agents is, okay, do I want to be part of the change or do I want the change to happen to me? And that becomes from a victim to what I even on the other end of that is being anti-fragile. It's like, how do you create companies that are anti-fragile? It's that they're changing faster than any other company. And they're going to make mistakes faster too. I'll just learn faster. I think somewhere around 2012, 2013, there was a really big trend of these, these larger global Fortune 100 companies starting their own venture sides, right? And also in-house incubators that ran independently of the parent company. Now, unfortunately, when things get tough like they are right now, they're usually the first things to get cut, right? But I think you're absolutely right. And I totally agree with you with everything that you're saying. It's because these companies are skating where the puck is right now and they're not going to where the puck's going as that famous Wayne Gretzky quote goes, right? So how do you convince one of these people or bring up these conversations to these CEOs and actually get them to change their belief system in the process? Well, I, I think my biggest wins have been, in, and I have a whole chapter on this called Accelerating Innovation, and it's just, just what you said, is looking at a company, you have to reinvent your company from the outside. And in the end, you want to create a digital copy or company that moves faster on your business model. And then ultimately literally have a company outperform your own company and then acquire back the old company. This model has been done. Like Apple is probably one of the best at doing it. In my book, I cover all the way back to Raytheon and World War II. We, we started kind of creating these, these things that worked outside independently because the bureaucracy, everybody doesn't want to change in a company and bigger companies and even small companies. And this is where it gets real scary. I go into a small company and- Well, let me ask you a question about that. Let me just stop you right there. Is that because- Everybody on the C-level suite, they all got fat and they just want to maintain and pander to Wall Street for quarterly expectations and not take the risk of getting that hockey stick one more time? Yeah, I, I think it's, you you know, I think, and this is where the model has changed, right? When things are moving so fast today is in the old days, I think it was just safer not to make a decision or not to do anything because if you did something and it didn't work, you were the one that actually, you know, could could get, you know, put out to pasture. Um, nowadays, so IBM. what's that? I think they call that IBM. Yeah. You never get fired for hiring IBM. Right. And I, I think that's changed <laughs> how people get fired for hiring IBM, but it's, it's, it's the idea that nowadays, if you don't take the risk, you actually will be, I mean, your company will be in, it's a grow or die situation. And I think that's where we are, especially for small and medium sized companies, the people that are mostly listening to this, this podcast is. You got to look at that as like, I have to make decisions and learn as fast as possible to grow as fast as possible, or I will be disrupted. There's always someone going to have a better business model than you. Your relationships are good to a certain standpoint. And that's what S small businesses are about. But when you start to scale and, and you realize that there's better business models that are selling for lower prices, and it's, it's like everyone's lazy excuse in corporate America that Amazon put them out of business, like Bed Bath & Beyond, they all have this excuse is like, they all had the opportunity to compete on a different way. And if you look at Amazon still is moving to figure out its own business model. And at the same time in my book, you know, Jeff Bezos kind of predicts, he's like, every company has a life cycle, you know, Amazon's going to run its course and die someday. And that kind of surprises people when people talk about that. But I think it's this idea that you have to change. And if you look at Amazon now, after Bezos left, they're having to make tougher decisions about where they're at because they're already just such a big company. They can't move very fast at all. And the executives, to your point about being bat and lazy, 
it's easier for them not to make decisions because they're managing multi-billion dollar decision, you know, industries. So why would I want to disrupt something that's working or I think is working? And I think that's the blind spot that we have is when we're still selling to the masses and you realize that the trends in the data would tell you something differently. You ignore that data because it's safer for you to keep your job for the next couple of years. And we're also reaching this period where these baby boomers that have led us in, into this are now at the end of their careers and they're starting to retire quickly. Well, that reinvention, we need to reinvent those companies, you know, with this new mindset or, or they're all going to die. For small companies, it's the same thing. We're going to go through the next five or 10 years. Um, all these family owned businesses are turning them over generationally or they're looking for exits. And that's probably the biggest opportunity for everyone here is to figure out how you can merge a few companies together that are in your space and build a better model. Maybe add AI to that, whatever it is, and make a better business model that you could read our book. <laughs> was that? Did you do your homework and read our book? We <laughs> we just released a book about that. <laughs> More, give us your humble opinion on the other side of the coin when you have a huge firm that is adamant on change, i.e. Facebook, and then puts all their eggs in that basket and then has to walk walk it back a bit. Kind of walk us through the mindset there. Yeah, well, um, I worked a little bit with executives there and, and, and had a lot of conversations about the massive, you know, commitment to a, a, a world, you know, and I think you realize that um, the news matters and it dictates, you know, everyone wants to be an AI company, you know, at this point. Um, you know, Web3, the metaverse, some of these things that were more trending a year or two ago and we're realizing the business models aren't mature enough. The, the point I think you, you made earlier, Matthew, is uh, figuring out the innovation piece of it that really when you're going to go exponential is thinking longer term. And the companies that have succeeded the most don't worry about the economic cycles. And I'd say Apple is, is one of those, even though they are kind of pulling back because they realize their own new business model, they have to reinvent that. Um, they're not pulling back like all the other tech companies, but with AI, we're going to be able to do things. You know, I was at a conference I spoke, uh, last week and it was, had AI and it was an AI conference and I spoke at it and a guy got on stage and he's like, we raised $20 million. And I turned around and I told all the people that we weren't going to invest in hiring more people with the 20 million. Is we're going to invest in AI tools so that my 20 people become superhuman developers and that we do a hundred times the work that we were doing last year because I trust my team and we can move faster and we're agile and lean and those AI tools enable us to do things. And everybody, all these investors, there's a group full of, you know, literally 100, 150, you know, investment firms and they all were like leaned in and you could see them all their mindset changing is like people no longer are the exact formula for growth. It's people plus the tools and it's to create the strategy to think big enough. And that's where my world's gotten really busy because I'm all about exponential thinking. How do we create a business model big enough that if you did implement AI and you did implement, you know, one of these other exponential technologies that I talk about in my book and you stack those, all of a sudden you see whatever your company is exponentially grow because you already have relationships with the companies. Now they know, you know, the industry. Now they know you can take them to the future of that industry. And that's where you're going to see every industry. And this is where the next layer of AI, you know, we, we have these generic kind of what I'll say tier ones that are, you know, chat GPTs and all this that people are using, but it's when you start applying that sliver to the laundromat industry, that all of a sudden laundromats start using AI in a way that literally predict when you need your clothes, how you get them, they deliver them, they disrupt the corner store laundry. And then now you just have a better model and. I think that's what we're going to see a lot of is using technology to make things easy for people, creating frictionless experiences and, and making life easy. And we're going to see their ability to, to do a hundred X of what they used to be able to do. Those companies that embrace those technologies are just going to exponentially explode. The ones that don't are just on a slow demise. It's either grow, grow or die. And I, I really think with exponential technologies, if you don't embrace growing exponentially, you are just another number. And to be honest, you're as good as your neighborhood relationships that if they can get their laundry delivered to their door for a quarter of the price, I'm sorry. You know, they'll see you at the HOA meeting, but they're not going to buy their lot. They're not going to get their laundry claimed from you anymore. I think right now we're at a place where 
if you have an A player on your team, you can their output can increase 10 to 15 times with AI, right? So I think those B players, you know, you can actually take a B player and make them an A player, but if you have an A player, it's going to exponentially increase yeah. what they can do, right? So I think AI right now, everybody's using it for blog and this and that, but it's going to create all these, it's going to make everything efficient where there's a lot of inefficiencies. Like you said with the laundry mat example, but just the, the um, the supply chain issues, when you have to order, when to reorder, how it automatically reorders, and you take out that human element of emotion, well, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I can't, well, here's what the data says, and it just automatically puts it in place and runs with the ball. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I think if, if you look at every little, I always like to use a very uh, laborious kind of example, because there's nothing safe, you know, in the world that we think that technology is not going to reinvent it. And really democratize it. I, I, I talk about in my book, these six D's that Peter Diamentis and Stephen Kotler created, um, is we're all heading democratizing every industry, which means uh, life should get exponentially better for everybody too. And I, I think we're going to have a different mindset of what work is and the four-day work week may be too much at some point in the future because we have all these things working back and forth. Like in our Change Agents Academy, we have this, uh, one of our, our members is a guy named Hey I Daddy. And he's definitely someone I recommend to be on your show, but he he's developed all these prompt engineering. And what we're also developing is these agents that all of a sudden I have my own agent that writes in my voice. And instead of, you know, Chad GBD doing that just for one session, it literally writes infinitely in my voice. So all of a sudden, you know, you have something that becomes authentically your own. That's a company that we've launched together through the change agent Academy. That's um, awesome. There's also every that. other agent you can think of, of every little task, you know, like, you know, obviously scheduling has been largely AI, but all those agents is teaching people like, okay, you yourself can exponentially get better at any aspect of your life. If you leverage this, now you got to develop your brand and your personality and what you stand for, not what you're against. Because so much of the world right now in politics and everything is what we're against. But in the new world, I believe it's going to be what you're for and you're going to attract those people into your life or into your industry that you're standing for something and you're moving in a direction that's meaningful. And that's where climate industry, um, you know, one thing is going to impact every other industry is how do we treat the planet? Just like how do we treat people? We have to think bigger about those subjects than we have. And small and medium businesses can literally grow exponentially if they embrace that thinking because that's what their competitors are. And when you actually stand for something, you're going to see in media and everything that people are going to be attracted to that. And that's where when in a world of abundance, it's not what you're against. Um, that'll galvanize people to be against you. And some of the algorithms work that way now. But I think in the near future, and I think it's kind of what Elon Musk is wanting to do with Twitter is how do you attract people into the content that matters to them? And uh, that's what we haven't done a lot of um, in the past. And I think we can do better in that. And our algorithms are kind of tiered. It's AI and all that is tiered to do more of that uh, than it has in the past. And that's, you know, there's lots of implications of that, but that's the digitally changing world that you got to think of your mind. And I, I use it as a mindset is we're now exponentially smarter than we've ever been. Knowledge does not matter. It is wisdom how to apply that knowledge. I don't believe you need to know how to do something anymore. You just need to who to do it with because the how is a given. I mean, you can go ask a question to AI and it'll lot the how, and it'll give you step-by-step, step, write the code, do all those different things. But if you don't apply that into what you're focused on or what you want to change in the world, then it doesn't matter because there's a lot of people that are going to still think that they can be everything and there'll be nothing. And that's where your brand matters is I want to be the guy that helps people think big, small companies, big companies. Um, at the end of the day, everyone can think bigger personally, professionally, and organizationally. You know, we're, you know, what's scary is we're still in inning one <laughs> with this AI and it's only the met it's been around for a while, right? But it's gotten released to the masses. What a couple months ago, the way it's compounding, there's a new GDP open AI tool every single day. I saw one the other day, um, auto GPT, where it's just, you speak into it and it can actually do everything for you. Unlike what Siri could do and Alexa could do, this is actually taking into account actual human speech and the way you speak so it's pretty scary so 
it's going to come a day where it just keeps learning and feeding itself and making new agents that make new agents, as you say, right? That are going to be accomplishing a lot of tests. I might, well, I'm going to put some people out of a job, so they better be getting better with their skills. But here's the thing. We're talking about AI. Small businesses in America, Main Street, Salt of the Earth businesses, my HVAC guy that runs a family-owned company for 30 years, he's not talking about AI right now, right? The laundromats we were speaking about, not talking about AI right now. The local pizza place, they're not talking about AI. So how do we bring a product to the masses for certain industries where we can get them to understand the potential of the AI, right? But do it in a way that's simply easier for them to use. Most of, most people right now are not going to know what a prompt is or say, act like this, do this. At what point do we come to a place where they can actually insert it into their business, plug and play almost? Well, I, I think we're starting to see that. And that's where, um, you know, you, you start to look at these different industries as you go deeper and deeper in each industry. It's adapting to the technology. I mean, it's the same, you know, there was a time then when people said that they wouldn't, you know, use their, use their cell phone. And there was a time when they said they wouldn't go on Google and wouldn't go on Facebook and wouldn't do, I mean, that resistance is here to say it's not going to happen. But what happens is when you exponentially get better at what you're doing, and this is where um, any company that is listening to this, you know, even just getting on chat GPT and having a free test at it and then starting to learn, it is the growth mindset and it's the learning mindset. And that's where I created this academy for this particular thing is companies, all companies will die in the next 20 years if they don't adapt. It's not to say that you're going to die fast. Um, some companies will die real fast. And and we're, we've seen that. We've seen many industries just completely get disrupted by technology. But what we're about to go into, and just think of this, in the next five years, we'll have more technological growth than we've had in all of history. And that is should be scary. And that's why, you know, as you see people signing letters about slow this down, we're not slowing it down regardless. You know, just if, if someone signs in the U.S. and we slow it down or if we want to kick TikTok out, it doesn't matter. It's, it's out there. You're going to, you know, those technologies you're going to get to if people want to get to them. I think it's a matter of embracing the change and understanding how do you benefit from it the most. And just understand that you're never going to be in control. And you always had a sense in the past that you were in control, but we've never been in control, complete control of our lives, our businesses, and all those things. The fact is, is that we have to learn with uncertainty more because things are happening faster, that our brain doesn't calculate at the speed that it, that it had in the past. And it's going to require our linear thinking, which we always think of chronologically. Just understand also in this next year, all people that do embrace AI probably will do 10x the work that they did last year. And that's where you start to see the people that are going to be the high performers, whether they're in an industry or a small business, or they're working in corporate America, you're going to see the difference of people that are willing to change. And if you think about it, these tools now are just wires that extend your brain into a network that you have all the knowledge in the world that are at your fingertips, or even just talking into something. And to your point, like auto GPT, look at how far it's come from Siri, right? It makes Siri look pretty dumb, right? Yep. And we used to always think Siri was pretty cool. Like last year, she was really cool. You know, Alexa, Siri, all these, like I said, they're, wow, I can talk and get an answer. Now it's like, holy crap, like we just 100x, if not 1,000x the experience. You know, so imagine, you know, next year when literally, you know, and you, you think of the things, and this is where Elon Musk is a mascot. If I had a mascot for exponential theory, you know, and his neuro, you know, neuro link, where his brain computer interface, you know, we are now learning that you can actually control thoughts to control, you know, kind of these conversations. And most of the conversation in neuro linguistic programming is subliminal and subconscious. So it's figuring out these things is technology is going to take us so much further faster than we ever, ever imagined. And that's as me as, you know, some people call me a futurist or, you know, these ideas, the future's now. And, you know, you can either embrace some of these things and start learning about them doesn't mean you have to become an expert because in the reality, no one's an expert anymore. Anyone that says they're an expert in anything, um, auto GPTs, you know, to your point, 10 days old. So we have 10 day experts in that, right? Um, <laughs> so they're 10 days ahead of us at this point. 
Aaron, I'm sold. I'm joining the Academy right after we get off here. So why don't you tell the audience where they can go, learn more about you, find you on the socials, join the Academy. Yeah, you can learn more about me at AaronBear.com, A-A-R-O-N-B-A-R-E.com or the XMBA.io. Um, we always say you you income as a, a linear thinker and you outgo as an exponential thinker. So exponential mindset, belief, and attitude is what XMBA stands for. And I really believe it, you know, we are teaching those tools and processes to help people think bigger. We you use those- plus a quarter million. What's that? And save yourself a quarter million. Yeah, no, more. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I literally just got off on a conversation and someone was asking, what do I get for my company and their company joined? And, um, I was like, this is something that you used to charge a quarter. I literally said this on a phone ride on the way over here back to my house. I said, it used to charge a quarter million dollars to do all these things. And now I wouldn't ever think that you even spend more than 25,000 to get every one of these things totally implemented and going you know, business in a box where you have a business plan and go to market, social media, social strategy, website. I mean, like the list of every single thing that you need, it's so easy to get in business. Everyone should, should be thinking about how they disrupt themselves um, and really disrupt whatever industry they're passionate about. Aaron, I really enjoyed this conversation. I definitely want to get you back on, but I have to run. I've got to bring my daughter to the softball. <laughs> okay. So Perfect. it's playoffs. It's the first day of the playoffs. So wish us a Uh-oh. Fun. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to pick this back up. So I'd love for you to come back on. I'm going to go out there and join the Academy. But I have one question before I let you run. And you can't say every industry. If you could pick one industry right now to disrupt with AI, what would it be? Well, I think what you're going to see is every company is a media company at this point. And then if you don't embrace that. So AI is about, and, and I'm, I'm answering your, your question backwards is it will it disrupt, but it's to focus on media and how do you optimize being exponential in media, which is exactly like my Change Ages Academy is for thought leaders and putting a group of people together that all wanna be thought leaders in whatever industry and then having them work with each other across different industries to learn and to apply AI and to apply Google, even Boolean searches as much as it sounds, um, very simple things and strategies of how people get ahead digitally um, and just being around those people that want to do that learning and growing. And it is a learning community. It has a course around these seven universal truths that we didn't get into. Maybe we can get into next time, um, that have, allow you a filter or lens into what you see your own views on, you know, we are habits. You're always right. Um, attitude is everything. The goal is not the end. What we resist persists, be in the moment. And then we are all one. Those are the universal truths in summary. But as you go into those, any one of those, they lead back to all the others. And their lenses that I saw that exponential leaders really kind of use these to kind of say, where is the real opportunity? So it ultimately, every industry will be affected, but I think the media industry, and that's why you're seeing a big pullback in Netflix and all these companies, because TikTok now has almost twice as much time spent on it as Netflix. So user generated content that is AI, and algorithm driven is already disrupting our traditional ways we watch media. And the next generation is not interested. AI, AI to video. Or, but when we go AI to video, we're AI to text right now. Yeah. It's That's happening video. right now. Aaron, thank you so much, buddy. We really appreciate your time. Everybody, that's a wrap. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to the show. And make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of The Liquid Lunch Project.